we have to create the right vibe, you know, the energy and everybody at the organization has to feel so privileged to be here. It's, it's no other way. Thanks for listening to the Purely Arsenal podcast. Please follow us on Twitter at Purely Arsenal FP for all the latest Arsenal podcasts. Welcome to our first post-game edition of the new season. It's Arsenal 2, Nottingham Forest 0. Nottingham Forest 1. I'll have to redo that. I'm not going to redo it, bollocks to it. How are you doing, Neil? <laughs> Neil Shaw with me. How are you doing, Neil? I think you were thinking about saying Neil, so that's why it's no. Neil. Yeah, like, like we'd never concede at the Emirates. Gosh, yeah. when was the last clean sheet they are? Is it been, know, we get one towards the end of the season? We did. We got one at the end of the season against Wolves, didn't so. we? But, so that yeah. one threw it off. But that almost doesn't count with how bad they were on the last day of the season. But um, yeah. Neil, it was an interesting day. For It was an early kickoff. You were there. Um, there was there was problems starting the game, the ticketing issue with the digital app that you were telling me about. There was even a point where I was getting some texts saying it might be might be. Despite they might not be able to correct this, they might not be able to get people in the stadium. They might have to stop the game. And I thought, oh, don't do that, please. You know, it was really buzzing for the start of the new season. But we did. We got started and we won 2 1. And there's a lot of positives, but there's certainly some areas of uh, of concern. Uh, Cracker Sacker cuts down Forest, is what I'm calling this. I think I think Mike gave me the idea for the Cracker Sacker. So, Mike, I've got to give you a shout out, shout out Michael Harris. But, um, but it, um, First game, when you saw the lineup, I know you don't like lineups much, but even did you look at it and go, what are we playing here? And what it looked like, tell me if you think I'm wrong, because my brother thought I was wrong, but what it really looked like, especially early on, was we were asking, we were overburdening players like Saliba and, and Party, and uh, we removed Gabriel from the first team for a tactical decision, which is really rare. And we looked like we were basically just trying to deal with a deep block. And inverting party and getting an extra man in midfield and things like that. Um, is that the way you saw it from within the ground? Or was it really difficult to understand what kind of system we were setting up and whether it was working or not? Um, right. I'll be completely honest with you. I, 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 I'm, I'm like you guys who are always spot on about looking at where Prado is going to fit in and how they're going to work amongst themselves and against the opposition. I'm, I'm normally not really look good with all of that stuff but when I saw it I thought hang on a minute firstly no Gabriel so I initially thought God is he injured I thought no please don't not first game of the season um, and then um, we saw someone said to me um, Sapai is going to be playing right back and I'm like huh so I was like <laughs> why <laughs> we got options there for other players to play that's not his position that really bamboozled me. and But for me, as you know, as I always moan about, the exclusion of Trossard really hit me hard again. And I'm like, no, not again. Um, and, and I thought, oh, you were muted there, Jack. Sorry. You felt he was going to start, did you? Like, Trossard? Oh, I would like him to start. Right. I would right. like him to start. I've been saying it for, for, for a long time that he deserves more minutes. And I just thought, so that means he's going to get another cameo of maybe 10 or 15 minutes max. Um, so... But I, I, I just, for me, the, 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 the fact that Party was off position or it looked like he was going to be out of position or not his normal place, in his normal place, I thought, what is he doing? Why is he doing this? And a lot of other people in the crowd were like the same. But I think our main concern was the fact that we were uh, struggling to get in the stadium. That was more on our minds than the lineup. And, um, yeah, I just want to have a quick word, so a quick word on that. It was absolutely, I don't think I was concerned for safety so much until there was one point where we started feeling that we've got nowhere to go and it looks like there's more and more people coming in and it fell that way. And you just start, you can't help but start thinking about Hillsborough. Of course. And, and, and we're like, why are they letting, why can't they now, they can see there's an issue so at the bridge point where people are coming across the bridge, why can't they stop people there? Because they easily do it when you're trying to leave the ground and they're managing yeah. traffic that way where they just stop people at certain points before allowing X number of people to go through again. So I'm thinking, why are they just letting people come in and come in where there's obviously nowhere to go? And that was, that was quite a little, that was a little bit concerning um, but more so because we thought we were going to also going to miss kickoff. We thought there's no way none of us were going to get in in time. 
Um, and then exactly as you, we were saying before you started that, you know, the one thing good about social media is the fact that everyone then found out that, right, okay, um, that it's going to be delayed by half an hour. But I thought it was a bad show from Arsenal because it took them a while to announce that on the Tannoys. And I'm not being funny, but those Tannoys, not very loud, not very awesome. clear. So people had to ask each other, well, what did they say? Well, you know, it's like, hang on a minute. This is a this is a multi million pound complex. God say, get a decent tano in place. You know, it's God, just yeah. stupid. Um, but yeah, eventually, after all of that, who are we? We did get in. The past started working again. Apparently, I don't know what the problem was. I don't know why it wasn't effectively um, tried and tested before. Yeah. Because why do that on the first day of the season? That is just stupid. Strange. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and it so it left a little bit of a bitter taste and a bit of anxiety in everyone's mouths. But once we were in, the relief is obviously, you know, wow, we're in. So it kind of, and then everyone just gets excited about the game just to get in their seats and being right, let's soak up the atmosphere. F- from that point of view, everything was the same, same as last last season. The atmosphere is brilliant. You know, everyone was singing, everyone was a good voice again. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's how the initial part of the game went for me. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's ridiculous. And hopefully it doesn't happen again. But uh, yeah. I don't think it did to Arteta any favours because the idea of this lineup was was probably the element of surprise. And some might, yes. say, why do you, some might say, why do you need to do that against a team for, like Forrest? But I presume from Arteta's point of view, he knows he's going to come up against some teams um, this season that are going to be, you know, really deep block, really low block. He probably knew that about Forrest, which I would argue from my perspective, I found it a little strange that we didn't play against anyone that would set up like that in pre-season. We didn't play against one team other than maybe Nuremberg in the first game of the season where we had like, you know, it was, it was kids in that game for half of it. And I found it a little bit strange when I saw our, our pre-season lineup that we playing against these big sides that were going to come out at us and play against us. And we knew we were going to set up against Forest. It was going to be two banks of four. And they really did sit deep. I mean, they were they were, they were were energetic. They were break, closing us down, but they weren't willing to come out at all. Not at all. Not even at 2-0, to be honest, um, which was quite quite incredible, really. And obviously, they did get some chances, but a large part, portion of their chances were just created by our silly errors again, um, where it, which... which which deviates how dominant the game really was. I also think the other thing that deviates how dominant the game really was is despite the fact we added in an extra midfielder or an extra attacker, whichever way you want to look at it, we didn't create as many clear-cut chances as we usually would in a game like this. So the argument from a someone looking in would be, well, did it really work then? Because the idea of this was to overburden one or two of your defensive players to allow yourself to to be able to be a little bit more um, you know, free-flowing in attack. And I don't think we really saw that fully, to be honest. Though there was a lot of openings, but there wasn't really those clear cuts. So, I mean, what do you think he's trying to do? I, I, in hindsight, my perspective from this is I think this is something he'll probably do only in selective games against maybe teams that are expected to finish in the bottom six or so. Um, that he expects that don't have a lot to do other than just to try to not allow us to score for as long as possible. And he, he wants to find a way to to break that down a little bit more. I think... I think in that sense, certainly in the first half, there was a lot of positives, Neil. I thought I thought we looked quite good in the first half, to be honest. And one positive is who's you got a first goal. It has to be Eddie Nketiah. He said he was a beast in training this week. I couldn't not start him. It would have been ridiculous if I didn't. Um, that might go towards what you said about Trossard, though, and I wonder what he has to do to get a start. But sticking with Eddie, we both had some criticisms of Eddie. And um, whilst I didn't think he had an like, amazing game or anything, one big chance, one goal. That's what you want your number nine to do. And we've argued in the past that Eddie doesn't really do that enough. And he did really well for that goal, didn't he? Martin Eddie was fantastic as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I credit where credit's due. Uh, I, I was the, the guy I was in next to, I was speaking to him and he and I said, um, uh, you know, Eddie gets blessing, gets a lot of criticism. And I said, a lot of that comes from me. And he started laughing. And I said, I, I just I just always thought that, you know, is he really up? To, for the levels of this team or where we want to go at least you know um, and with the ambition that Artis has got, got is Eddie really the right fit and the right calibre of player um, why Why is he sticking with him what, Eddie why does he speak so highly of him every single game that he plays in you'll see that Artis are after the game he's up there giving him a hug and putting his arm around him <clears throat> so he's obviously a, he, he admires him He's one of his favourites by the looks of things and he obviously wants him to do well, which is great. And it's nice to see that from a manager, especially when you used to 
see Wenger mentor a lot of the, of the players. You remember when he used to be like a, a father figure to them. So there's nothing wrong with that. But I've just felt, is he really, is he really the right person? But to be fair, he never, he never not puts a shift in. That's something we've never said. We've never said he doesn't put a shift in. He, he works hard. He put, put, you know, he really does play out his skin and does everything he can for, for the team. Um, it's just, it's just his end product really at times and, and what he does while he's on the pitch. He's no Jesus. He doesn't offer that kind of confusion to the defence where he's just, he's just like, you can't even pin him down. He's all over the place, which really creates havoc for defences. He's not that kind of player. But I think he he didn't do much wrong. He, he was there and thereabouts. And then, of course, I've got to give a shout out to Martinelli because, gosh, number one is energy. Can I just say as well, Martinelli and, Mar- and Saka, I saw close up Saka, what he did a couple of times, but Martinelli from, from the other side, he, a couple of times, the way he tracked back to defend from the top, from the front, was unbelievable. I'm thinking, who's that? And I thought, that's got to be one of the def- Is that Rice? Oh, my God, no, it's Martinelli. It's like, what? what we did that we collectively got- really well as yeah, well we in the first half, but Martinelli yeah, because- was a standout. Yeah, because apparently, in terms of def- the defenders, which, we, which you talked about, Jack, they didn't have much to do in a weird way because all the defending was being done up top. Yeah. It was really bizarre to see. And I, I don't know if, again, that was part of his plan. But Martinelli did that brilliantly. But his energy levels, Christ, as always. But that piece of skill. Now, some people are saying it was, it was a, you know, it was, he miskicked it or something. I can't see it. Again, just, you know, before I went to bed last night, but, um, I looked at the match of the day had, had, uh, highlights, which don't get me started on match of the day, by the way. Don't talk about them. Oh, yeah, I don't watch it. Oh, my God. I mean, did they just sit there criticising what we did and then didn't even bother looking at the two goals, which I thought are already two goal contenders of goal of the month. I'm like, what? what? Anyway, nothing. but anyway, at least I saw the goal and, and, and the re- slow motion replay. I'm sorry, that looked like, it didn't look like a miss kick. It looked like he turned and he just... It was almost Bird Campesque in a way. It was just great. Anyway, I, that's my opinion. I, I thought that was de- uh, deliberate by him. Great piece of skill. But Eddie still had some work to do even following that. He didn't just receive the ball and could knock it in. He had to move away, give himself some space, and that was a great finish. And yeah, all right, he got a slight deflection, deflection which you know gave Turner no chance. But great finish and a good start. Really good start. And I and I agree with you, Jack. I didn't see much wrong in that first half, apart from obviously when I had that chuck there was like an exchange of headers, one just got away and obviously the guy didn't uh, you know, he didn't finish he didn't he didn't complete the goal. Yes, yeah, yeah. Run, and that run, was in run, the run. first ten minutes, wasn't it? Yeah. It was in the first time that for me, that was literally their only shot off target, if you like. It wasn't I mean it was on target the shot. No, he he lobbed it over the bar, yeah. Or because it down. was all as then you said we were just kept on at them. We, I, my, so I was I was sitting uh, the opposite end of the tunnel. And I'll tell you something, my head was all looked on the direction of their goal. And I was, again, I said to the guy next to me, I said, I haven't really done anything other than this side. We haven't even had the ball in our half, really. That's why I said earlier about the defenders not having to do much because it was all on the other end. Right. So you were right, they had a high block, uh, a low box, low block, sorry. They, 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 they were just sitting back and it was all of us trying to play a game of chess to try and break them down. But I thought, I thought, apart from that one potential chance that they had, it was all us in the first half. And I have to give a mention to Timber as well. I think he looks solid. I know he was making a few. I know he was making a few misplaced passes and stuff. But and, and there was a little bit. He was a bit scrappy at times. But generally, he looks like a really good player to me. He looks. He looks like a Sinchenko that can defend, and he's strong. He's physical. And I think he's intelligent as well. He's got yeah. good awareness. He's intelligent, and he's a great one-on-one as well. So I, I, I think he's a. That's what hurt me the most about about him than his injury. But we'll talk about that in a second. Right. But yeah, I thought Ed, I thought Eddie Nketiah, job well done, and you know he deserves some credit for his performance. Yeah, no, he does. I, I, and that's something we, we we probably don't do enough on this podcast, not, not purposely or anything like that, but sometimes we, he comes in for some criticism from us, you know, at times. And I, I thought in, in the first half, he was a big part of, of what we done well. And he, he does really well at pressing from the front, I think, Eddie. And collectively, one thing I thought was different, because it was a whole different lineup that I was even trying to understand how we were moving. But I think we the, the idea behind it was to overburden some of our best players. And I thought we tried to overburden William Sleever. We basically said, we think you can handle everything on your own. 
Let's see if he can do it. And he basically can. He basically can. I know we conceded the odd stupid chance, but William Sleeber was, I thought, pretty terrific. He had a 97.7% pass accuracy. I mean, you don't see those numbers that often. Um, He also was our highest passer, so it's not like he didn't use the ball. He was our highest touch player, (laughs) um, and he had our our highest percent pass accuracy. So just... But beyond that, when when he's going one versus one, I, I trust him against basically anyone. And um, you know, I, I proved it against Holland, didn't he? Yeah, he proved it against Holland. Holland. He's proved it against Mbappe in, in France. Yeah. We've all seen the clips. Um, and I, I thought he was he, he was terrific. And I, I think the other person, which was quite interesting, that he overburdened certainly positionally was was Thomas Partey. And I thought he handled it really well as well. To yeah. be honest, for someone that doesn't do that that often, I know we saw it. I think we saw it once or twice at the end of last season. He actually did it at Forest away where we lost, and um, he did it maybe maybe in one other game um, where he was kind of inverting central midfield, even dropping into centre back at times. And um, but I think his idea also. I thought was Gabriel out of all of our centre backs. I don't think Gabriel was as good on the ball as White and Saliba, for example. I think they're technically a little bit better, and I think maybe that was part of his idea there as well. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing with Timbo, I think he's he, he definitely can challenge Zinchenko in the long term as well. But the weird thing about it is he doesn't have anywhere near the amount of touches that that Zinchenko does. In fact, I think there's a stat out there that says Zinchenko averages about 56 passes per game, and Timba had only 51 touches in this game. Now, the reason I bring that up is in the last game as well, I thought Timber was really good, but I don't think he really built the play like Zinchenko does. And it was the same thing. He had he had a very low touch map um, on, on the game. But you're right, in terms of the duels and his ability to positionally be really aware, I like him. I like him a lot. I think he's going to really provide a different option. I think he's going to be really important for games like last week against City. Whereas games like this week, if you think about it, where we were trying to overburden players and get another attack, it's interesting. would be perfect for this game. Perfect. Because, exactly that. because you're just pushing them back and you're like, who's your most creative source? And just put your number 10 left back on and you're perfect. So it's really interesting. I was just watching it. It was like, there is some real positive. The last thing was what you said was, like, I've never seen us work so hard to get the ball back. I don't think I've ever seen us oh my work God. that hard. And even to the point where at 35 minutes or so, I was going, this looks exhausting. Like we are, we are playing some good stuff, but if we lose it, there's like three of them around it straight away. It's like insane. And I went, I w- and I wonder if the second half, because I felt the second half before the goal, we felt a little bit complacent, a little bit lazy, a little bit sloppy. I don't know what it was, but also maybe a little bit tired. Maybe, maybe we were a little bit tired. First game, so intense in the first half. Maybe Sillily took off a little bit off the gas at 2-0, which we should never do because we've been proven last season not to do that. And it was, you know, I think like you, we were all really frustrated. But before we get to that, like um, Saka, I mean, the, both the wingers oh. were fantastic. Martinelli was fantastic. Saka just so good. I mean, people are putting him in the argument as top three right wingers in the world. I don't know what he is, but I just know he's fantastic and I wouldn't change him for anybody. And that was it with some speed, wasn't it, Neil? <laughs> I I swear to you, uh, Jack, the stadium was like there. Everyone was picking up their mouths or their jaws afterwards. Everyone was just looking at it. I mean, obviously, everyone mental, but everyone was looking. And then when the um, replay one came on, the gasp in the crowd, the gasps were like, wow, oh, my God. He, you know, uh, it's just, it's priceless. It's priceless. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, people talk about stupid money in football, and yeah, I know he's on a good wage now and what have you. And yeah, I mean, it's all silly money, but he's, you could actually point your finger and say, he's one of the ones that do deserve it. If there is such a thing about deserving good money, because he just doesn't stop dropping. I mean, yeah, all right, let's, let's talk about he kind of, you, you obviously could tell at the end of last season, he was physically gone, he was losing it. But even then, for his, he, he was still at a good, a good level if you think about it. Yes, he, he was tired out, but he was. You, when you put Saka in your team, you know you're going to get something. You're going to get something, and sometimes very, very special. And that's what we saw again on Saturday. Um, I just want to say again, you were talking about um, Party. Now Party was up there. He was involved in that move. So was Saliba. Now Saliba he, was. He, he was, he was the opposite. It, it was he was the assist. I mean, yeah. he was right. He was right, he was almost like playing like a a right winger at one point because he was asked for the position he was in and the way he won the ball back. He, he created all that. That came from the corner, didn't it? It came from a move which Havertz put a good cross in, um, and then it led to the corner, and then that's where that came from. And Saliba was works with a little. He got the ball back. I think he passed his party, and then he got it back, and then. 
provided the assist. And I'm thinking, so we got Partey and Saliba way out of position, creating this chance. Um, but I think that's what that game was all about. That's exactly what you were saying. And and um, but then the way Saliba, uh, sorry, the way Saka just took that, it's a trademark goal. But that's one of the best ones I've seen. That was unbelievable. And I'm, you know, it's one of those ones where it doesn't matter how amazing a goalkeeper you are, you they would just stand there and say. Wow, there's nothing I can do about that. No one in the world could do anything about that, and you can see it by Havertz. It exp- just Havertz was like, "What the hell have I just seen?" It's a bit like, do you remember the reaction to from the players when Saliba scored his goal? Was that against Fulham? I can't remember now. Uh, Bournemouth away. Zinchenko, Bournemouth. yeah, when Zinchenko put his hands up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, same <laughs> thing. Same thing. Game. What Havertz it's did. Like, yeah, I love that. What? Stuff. They're like what? Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But you know, the surprise from Havertz, and this is from a player that you expect it from anyway, because he's so good. So Libby would probably not expect that. But even he was, you know, they, 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 it was just so cleanly hit. It was driven, it was powerful, it was accurate. It was just like a dart, an arrow, what you want to call it, a bullet. No, nothing. Just beautifully, beautifully executed. Um, and it's what Saka does, it's what Saka gives us. And you're thinking 2 0 in control of the game, what can go wrong? And then obviously we we know what went wrong with Timber and all the rest of it. But I thought I thought, wow, Saka's unpl- undroppable. If yeah. he's fit, he's just undroppable. We cannot do without him at the, the moment. The worry is do we have anyone that can make him play less than ninety minutes it's, every week? It's that. And also my only other concern is which you're probably going to bring up, I'm sorry to tread on your th- uh, toes. We seem to be too too right centric as well. Which is, we, we, we're too focused on the right. I felt as well at times. And there were there were times there were times when Martinelli was actually putting his hand up, saying, "Why aren't you giving me the ball?" Yeah, and felt then, very and then, isolated. And then and then when then obviously then when he got it, he proved it. He said, "Look what I can do to, to, to for the first goal." Um, so I, I think that's something that does need to be addressed. I yeah. think that you you've got to try and balance out the attacks on both sides rather than. Always Saka, Saka, Saka. We, we've, we've got to do that because we've got a very decent player in Martinelli. And there's times if, when Trossard does play, he's more on the left as well. He's more yeah. sided to the left. And we've got to then make use of him because, you know, yeah. we just got to. We've got to I, feel, I felt that was our biggest error actually on the left because like I just said Timber, relatively low touch. But Havertz is also a pretty low touch player. I mean, he was right there with Timber. He had 69 touches. Your top players out of 133. I don't think Havertz is going to be a high touch player, just like Xhaka wasn't in his final season because everything went through other players. So you, if you've got two, then Martinelli just ends up doing all the work in terms of the attacking ability. And, and he's really good at doing that. He's good at overloading himself and taking on two players, but gets exhausting and he needs a little bit more support. And I just felt if you played Trossard in that eight this for this game because you were it was much more about intricate short tight stuff um, I felt it was more of a game for Trossard than Habits at the eight if you want to play Habits higher up that'd be different but I felt at the eight whereas last week's game against City I know we played Habits at the nine but it felt much more of a Habits game you know I felt it's so I just if it, you know he said certain games certain tactical reasons in my opinion in hindsight I think I think it was probably much more of a, a Trossard game from the eight than it was Habits, but but because yeah, it just felt like Martinelli, like you said, was doing a. Ahead- That's why it was so impressive with what he was doing. And Arteta alluded to it. He said he just well, when he does things both ways he, and what he did defensively, he said he's he's really hard to live with, and he, he loves that. And that's what he needs from his wingers. And that's why certain wingers in the past, Pepe etc., have not worked from us because we just know they don't do it both ways. And we know Arteta; it means everything to Arteta to do that. Yeah. Third yeah. one there. I know we have Trossard, but it does feel like Trossard is becoming more and more of a uh, interior player, not a not a wing mm. player for us. You know, mind you, did you see Trossard's speed on that run? Right. Okay. I've, I've Havertz got- as well, yeah. by the way, I, I, did it I, later I, on I, as well. But yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because that was after I think they scored, wasn't it? I'm yes. Yes. Later on. Yeah. But after they scored, and I was I was actually giving credit to the guy that made the goal for them because. My God, watching him go down because that's that's the side we were on, and we were just like, oh my God, we're in trouble, we're in trouble. Look at his pace. He was so much should have come across there though, because I've rewatched yeah, yeah, it back a while, and I don't really blame Saka because he was always behind him. But I actually was felt why was it why that could have closed in? Why it could have come across? And actually, yeah. it, Rice looked exhausted. But I actually, if you watch it on like the halfway line mm. and you don't get told what happens, you'd say in your head, Rice gets across, but he doesn't get across. Doesn't get oh, across. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think I think we yeah there there were errors there were errors I believe but he was quick as well we got to factor that in he was phenomenally quick yeah. um and it, it was it was it was just over in the blink of an eye it was so fast and like all of a sudden 
then we were we were kind of blocked because you know everyone stands up because to see what there was going on. So we we were blocked a little bit from the angle we were at, and of course then you just hear them all roaring. We were for oh Christ! So it was so fast. But then we saw Trossard do something similar against someone who was about four times his size. Which was hilarious. Amazing. Wasn't it? Hilarious to watch, but his speed, and I've never seen that from Trossard. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been waxed lyrical about him, about, you know, ever since yeah. he came, and I've been crying, please give him more time. But I've been talking more about the, what he does, you know, with his passing, with his vision, uh, the fact that he, he, he creates something very, very different for us when we need it. I've never seen him speed, speed with speed, though. Oh, my God. He is quick. I don't know whether he was like Shane. Look, this is another facts to my game boss. You've got to be picking me, mate. You know why? Why am I well, not getting more? Arteta was on, feet, on his feet and clapping at that point. I yeah, remember good, seeing good. it. Yeah. Well, that's good. it. That's what. That's what he needs to do. But God Almighty! I, I was. <laughs> we were laughing. <laughs> Look at the speed of this guy. Where does that come from? But you're right. Havertz did it as well. And for Havertz, who's quite tall, isn't he? Yeah, he's quite he's a tall really guy. Fast when he gets going. To, 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 to be that fast. That's impressive. So mm. another thing we've got in our locker, but yeah, yeah. you're right. No, I thought Trossard, again, he's just so impactful and eye-catching, oh. Trossard. When it, it doesn't matter if he plays five minutes or, or 20 minutes. He just, he's just such a good example to the squad, I think, because we don't have oh. enough impactful subs, I don't think. We don't have enough players. Like Reese Nelson was a really good one last season, but, mm. but um, and Smith-Rowe in the past. But but yeah. I think Trossard, every time you start him, you do, he, just, he just brings it every time to, to, yeah. to, to the table. And he's pushing whoever... Position, he. I think he's still more likely at this point to slot in at the because you just the left wing. It's such a different style to Martinelli that I, I feel like it, it might be a little bit more more difficult. But but I, I the nine or the eight, I feel like he's a really good option still. Personally, I, I'd I'd be picking him as a, as my secondary option to, to Jesus and probably my secondary option to to Declan Rice as well. But but I just yeah, I mean I just think um at, if Rice is playing at the eight, of course. But um I, I just think yeah, he's just jumping off the page. You know, it's really hard to to look at him and think, how can you not be starting right. some games, you know, at least some games, not every game, but yeah. at least some Premier League games. He doesn't really start very many. And I felt like, I feel like he really should be, but yeah, that, that speed was brilliant. Well, I'm just, you just didn't expect it. And that, that's a really, really good thing to, to notice, just to be able to relieve some pressure and things like that. Not that we were really under the cosh or anything, but the, the thing that frustrated me most on the goal is he basically, he was so fast, but he ran from the halfway line to our area with no one attempting to actually. No one was Exactly, and if you're not going to do that, then you better make sure you've got everything covered in the box. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Every, yeah. They're, 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 you're like, I'm, t- I'm waiting because there's only one player in the box, and I'm not going to make sure he doesn't get the ball. Yeah, and we didn't I'm do that either. So I was so like, glad. Well, yeah. When I was watching it, I was just like, that's so frustrating from the point of view that I'm not even sure if we could have got across to him, but someone's got to get closer to him to stop 100%. the cross. And yeah. there was there was two fr- I, I, again. Maybe I'm, I, I've got my sack of goggles on, but I, I don't think it was really. He was he was behind him to start with. It was really hard for him to catch him. But Rice could have come across. Didn't come across. White could have come across the side and stay in the box. But if you do that, you've got to got to win. And I think it was White White's man that he lost out to and, and ended up putting it past Ramsdale, which was frustrating. But. Look, we weren't under the cover, but it was definitely nerve wracking. I mean, you, whenever Arsenal go, you know, within within a goal with 10, 15 minutes to go, you, we're nervous, aren't we? We're, we're always nervous. And we had the better chances after that. Odegaard, just wide, I think, um, you're from far. Oh, yeah. I thought it was going into the top corner. Havertz obviously had that, that sprint and run and shot. Um, and, and maybe one or two others, but we didn't create an, a, enough clear cut chances. But obviously, the biggest downer on this game, and the reason you said you felt sort of down at the end of it, despite mm-hmm. the win, was, was Timber's injury. I think there's been a lot of reports on it. So what basically happened was he lost the ball and uh, he did lose it. It wasn't great. He lost a short pass and he obviously went and dove in. But from everything I watched on the, the video, it's his back leg that gets tucked underneath him that seems to be the injury on. And then he tries to uh, play on and comes out for the second half and plays a, a minute or two or maybe maybe less. And then as he's jogging backwards, he clearly feels something in the in the back of his knee. And uh, But but Mikel Arteta was interesting. He said, yeah, we're, we are worried because the docs basically gave him the all clear to try and go on it. And a lot of people have sort of speculated, even I've sort of talked about it, but I, from the mechanism, it's really, really on the right, I think it's right knee, really, really difficult to believe that it could be anything big ligament wise, really, really difficult. I mean, you can do one injury for a big ligament like your PCL, but he didn't fall on it like that. He felt fell on it in a weird way. And the one thing with knee injuries is I see so many of them. I've had like two this week. Um, the mechanisms actually really make sense for big ligament injuries. So like there's like only two ways that you can actually injure certain ligaments and almost 99% of the time, that's exactly how it happens. So it's almost like you could be watching it on the sidelines and have a good idea for what it could be. The problem is the cartilage stuff like um, Jesus had, 
it's quite hard to understand whether that could have happened from that injury. But what's a good sign, I think, is that doctors who are competent, they have to be competent, um, they gave him the clear, which make, makes me think, still think it's a muscular issue. Even though he pulled up not very nice and it, looked, it, kind of, it looks like he kind of snapped his knee back or whatever, it tells me that it was from the first half and, and they thought he could go on it. Maybe it's a muscular thing and want to see how he goes on it. And and if it is muscular, hopefully he didn't do too much more damage to it in the second half. That's the concern. But And maybe it's a, a short term thing. Maybe we're looking at a a three, four weaker, maybe even slightly longer Absolutely. than that, but not something, not yeah. something talking the mumps like Jesus's injury was in terms of cartilage. In terms of ligament, big knee stuff, I'm not going to get egg on my face, but I'm, I'd be really surprised. I'd be stunned if it was that. I, re- I really would be really surprised because one, the docs would have recognised it in the evaluation. I just, I just can't believe they wouldn't have. Been. Let's hope you're right, Joe. But either way, Neil, just to talk on that position a little bit more, and I've mm. discussed um, how much we liked Timber and how unfortunate that was. Um, Zinchenko's coming back but also Tierney wasn't in the squad he wasn't in the squad Neil. Mm-hmm. and um, mm-hmm. that's do you think what do you think the intention is there because he, he put him in the squad last week and brought him on against uh, Man City in the Community Shield he's played him not started him but played him a bit since here and there and a lot of people have been pretty positive about his performance I was when I went to saw him against Barcelona I thought he came on and did really well against um, Dembele I think it was yeah I agree um, this is obviously a clear, maybe is this a clear indicator from Arteta that's like yeah you whether it needs to be moved from your side, Kieran, you're not going to be part of our plans this mm. season. What, 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 what do you not think? Because he can be quite ruthless, Mick Arthur. I would like not to speculate too much, Jack, because it could we could be barking down the wrong wrong, wrong tree or barking up the wrong tree. We we really could, but it is a bit odd that he wasn't even on the bench. That that was a little bit strange when you know Sinjay goes out completely. Right. Uh, all right, we've got Tommy Asu who obviously can play, and he's done well in that position in the past when he's needed when we called upon him but it's still strange that hang on a minute because it could be something that could happen on the other side and Tommy Asso might need to be brought in for that side because obviously he can play uh, on in the right right position as well so I found it a bit weird I, I like you was from the top of this show you said did you look at the team lineup and think hang on a minute what's going on here also looking at the subs bench it was a bit odd that he wasn't in it at all and it's just from that you might start speculating that I think he's gone. There could be something that's telling us that if he's not in the squad completely for the first game of the season, arguably where he could come in and help if need be, because Forest have been a bane for us recent couple of right. not two three seasons. Didn't they knock us up two years running in the FA Cup before? Yeah, last season? well, that season we wore the uh, no more red shirt, the yeah, white, sh- white shirt they knocked us out. You that's might be it. right. I don't remember that season a few years back. Yeah, so that's yeah. Cool so, and, and then obviously, you know, with the, the league and the Prem as well. So, you know, this wasn't a, a laughable, a joke of a game. We had to take this very, very seriously. And you need your the best you can have. And I found it very odd that he wasn't on. So it could be a message. It could be something, or sorry, not message, um, a statement that, yeah, we're looking to offload him. Now, whether that be a permanent move or a loan, I don't know, but it's not. The only links I, have been I, a loan, haven't they? Yeah. I mean, so, I, know, I know, I know, I know for him, he's probably third or fourth choice now. I, I, especially now with Timber, Sinchenko, Tommy Asu, arguably as well. Who came on, um, yeah. I, I, And Kiwiho, yeah, of course. Yeah, Christ. Kiwi-ho. Yeah. I forgot about him. So where does that leave Tierney? And I get it, but I, do you remember, was it in the last, last pod, the last time we spoke? I would started changing my mind, thinking I'm a little bit now 50-50. I don't mind whether he, if he goes, he goes. If he stays, I'll be just as happy. Yeah. I don't, know, I, I don't want to look too much into it at the moment. Let's just see what happens. Um, but, but speaking of that, on that side of things, we do need to start getting rid of players because it's crazy. We've got to, we, we, the, the, the wage bill again is going to be overloaded, and yeah. we need we need to relax that a little bit, especially if. You know, if Arteta is still thinking in the mindset that he wants to keep rebuild, wants to keep building, keeps building, thinking about other players that might want to come in, maybe not this window, but January or next season, we need to start getting rid of some of the players that we don't use, like the Pepe, Cedrics, etc. And Tierney, unfortunately, might be one of those. It's, it's, there's a very good chance. We've got Laconda, we've got Taveras, you know, we've got all those players that we need to, to look at. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what you feel about it, but it could, it could be make a statement. Yeah, I think anyone that's on over a hundred grand a week and that is mm. not part of the first team squad, we we, we have to be. And Tierney's on one hundred and twenty grand a week. So, you just, mm. but the problem is uh, the loan stuff. I just think's 
ridiculous you've got to be able to get a permanent sale tier and you've got to be able to get some money in for him i oh, mean yeah. i'm not even at this point i'm not even sure because there was there was ridiculous um analysis of kieran tierney's value people going up to 40 50 million i mean absolutely no chance but even if you just manage to get money back on him where you kind of you know break even which was what 25 million 20 25 million I mean, oh, surely. That, yeah yeah that, that, i find it really surprising that there's not i know he's had an injury history didn't play that <laughs> much last season but when you see the, the the need and the sort of left backs people are going after i i, I just you know, he's still in his prime. He's had some, you know, won a lot of things at Celtic. He had a pretty good, successful career at Arsenal, I would say, up until this point. Yeah. I find it very strange. And I can only put a little bit more onus on the club to be like, we've got to find a way to sell him. And maybe we're holding our nerve because I think we're doing well with that with Balogun because I think we will end up mm. getting a good fee for Balogun. Mm. But there's a lot of interest in Balogun. There's not an obvious interest in Tierney, which I'm finding really quite surprising, especially as everyone tells me how great he is. And I'm like, well, where's the interest then? There's got to be some interest from someone. Yeah. You know? So um, I hope we see some interest that's actually for a permanent deal. Uh, I don't hear about loans at almost 95% of clubs, but when Arsenal come along, everyone wants to loan our players, which is very odd. But um, So we've got, to just, we've got to be a bit stronger in the market, maybe. But the other thing, two things I want to talk about this game, just before I go on to uh, one sort of transfer thing that I think is going to get announced today, but I might be wrong. Um, yeah. um, I don't always know, but I think it will be announced today. But... Um, Declan Rice, how do you feel he did? He played alongside party in this game. Um, how do you feel he's progressing? I don't think he's fully fit yet, but what was your thoughts on how, you know, his performance? He actually had a couple of opportunities going forward in the second half. Probably could have scored. I hit the post, I think. Had a volley that he could have done a little bit better with. Um, what's your thoughts on where he's at at the moment, Declan Rice, and how he's fitting into the group? I think we've got to forget about price tags. Just forget about it. And I know that we're sensible. We don't, we don't do that. With, you know, we look at we look at Havertz. Something I think he's I think he's getting a lot of unnecessary criticism for the same reason. Sixty five million is a lot of money. It's one of our biggest outlays for a player ever in history. Um, and just got to forget about that. Just think about what the player can bring to the team. That's the most important, and how how they're going to fit in and going forward with that. Uh, and the same with Bryce. All right, he's got this our record signing, but forget that. At the moment, I think you're spot on. I don't think he's quite there. He's not 100% yet fit. I think he's built... He, every time I see him, it's, you know, so leading from the preseason friendlies to this game, the Community Shield and then this game, I think he's getting a bit better. Yeah. And that, and that is a clear indication that he's getting his fitness back. I think he, I think he's a wonderful signing. I'm not thinking about the price tag. I just think he's a wonderful signing. He's going to give us so much. Um, and and he's going he's gonna to be that player where yeah, I think we saw it in the Community Shield and the, the tracking back he was doing and, and winning, the, winning the ball. Uh, you know, this is the thing that he's been brought in for, to break up those attacks, to be a real thorn in the opponent, especially in the midfield and, the, and that engine area, and it, for, and to work for the team in a way that he's going to break up uh, attack, any potential attacks. He's a strong, physical player that's going to really get on the opponent's nerves. Um, and then I, I, I felt that he, he, he was better. I think for me, this was probably his more polished performance so far. So that is great. If each game he's getting better and better, he's going to be wonderful for us. And um, yeah, you're right. There was a couple of times where he got forward. The first, the, the one that you said that he, I think Turner got a touch to it and it hit the post. That was actually a brilliant move. If you look, if you yeah. watch the whole move back, that started all the way from there, there, you know, from the back with Odegaard winning the ball. And that there was a passage of passes and that was a fantastic uh, move. And if that had gone in, that would have been another world class goal, a team goal. Um, and it, it was it was just um, it was a good strike. Just Turner just got her hand to it and it hit the post. I think. And I, we all thought it was in because again that was the side that we were on, and we thought, oh, is it? And then we, oh, nice God, I think he got a save to it. And I think I think we said yes, yeah, hit the post as well. So I thought that was great. And then yeah, the, the, it was like a volley kind of shot, wasn't it? And he he was disappointed. I think he floored it unintentionally first. It still actually met, took, got a drove a save out of uh, Turner as well, even even with that. But if he'd got a clear hit on that, I think that could have gone in. So he's, yep. he's an option to score as well. So it's not just what he does from uh, from whatever you want to call him, uh, you know, is, 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 whether he be a, a, a six or a eight. But you know, he's got he's got the ability to score, and I think that's the difference. West Ham saw more of a defensive machine from him because. When you play West Ham, what what do the better teams do? They just go for them, don't they? Because they're one of those teams that you just got to go for. But but with Arsenal, with a more forward thinking team, more attacking team, creative team, 
he's going to be able to have the chances to maybe even be like what Shaka was doing for us in a way uh, and getting up there, getting the assists, getting goals, being more creative, moving forward. So I think we're going to see a different, different, different type of player than what West Ham saw, but also with the West Ham qualities. And he's a leader. I think he's a tremendous signing. Yeah, potentially. The matter, I think. I think. You know what? I was. I was concerned. Not concerned. I was a bit surprised with Odegaard being. And I know you love Odegaard, and I. I do too. But I know you're a massive fan of him. Huge. And I, I, I was thinking on that day, on Saturday, sitting there watching, this guy he is as as everyone, every all of you guys were said it. He does lead by example. He's not one of those vocal captains. But he leads by example by what he does on the pitch. He's fantastic. So I think he is the right choice now. Um, before he had Shaka almost like a backup captain. Now he's got Rice, and what a tremendous leader we got in him as well. And he's loving it. You, you you can see how absolutely thrilled. Do you know if there's anything I'll say, which has actually worked against him in a little bit? I think he's actually overwhelmed with being at Arsenal. He's utterly overwhelmed. He's so in it. And he's so become so involved in it. He's he's thrilled to be at the club, and I think at the moment it's just the, the fact that he's walking in, out into the you know, the Emirates, the, the pitch, everything. He's almost like a fan in a weird way at the moment. But once that's gone, we're gonna we, we're gonna see the best of him. Yeah, I've got no concerns about him at all. No, no, I me mean, neither. I think he's getting better every game. Um, that clo- uh, right. So now, it was really interesting to see him get forward as well. Um, he had the most shots out of the team, most shots on target. Um, he wow. had, yeah, he had most tackles. Um, well, actually, Kai Saka had the most tackles, but then Declan Rice had four tackles, most tackles. And I, I do feel he's really good at that. He's really good at um, duels, really, really good at interceptions, yeah. which is what a lot of the data said. And when you're seeing the prices for um, Saicedo recently, which is oh about 10, God. 15 million higher, with sell on clauses included in that, which wow. is incredible to me. I mean, that's basically saying we're going to give you all this money and then we're going to give you more if he ever leaves us, which is incredible incredible um to, to, to give them that much money i mean it's a record for the league um with a player by the way who's played less than 45 premier league games when declan rice is what close to 300 something like that so i mean there's a huge i mean some people have argued me because i love side i thought he's a great player yeah. he's a great player but um i said that there's no way those fees should be comparable even if even if i do like side and the reason for that is you know longevity from the players and secondly English tax is really real and there's a reason people want players that are English you know homegrown you know it counts towards that there's a real sort of you know a belief that they, they, they can create this sort of character and leadership earlier maybe within the group and I think there's some some truth to that possibly not always but some, sometimes so that there should def- definitely be a bigger distance from the two fees but Declan Rice should be a lot higher so I'm not saying we got a bargain but when you compare it to the other fees of Defensive midfielders going True. to the league. You can see why we did our business early, which was really clever from Edu and Mikel. Last one on Havertz. You mentioned him earlier that people, you know, Chris, so did you notice anything in the crowd where people were getting on his back or frustrated or anything like that? Yeah. I worry a bit about that because of his sort of style and the way he is on the ball. Sometimes it look, can look a little bit languid and a little bit mm. lazy, um, like a, an Ozil possibly. Ozil, yeah. Where, who, who personally I got very frustrated with, but for different reasons. Um, did you notice any of that? Do you have any concerns think. about his performances at the uh, moment with Havertz? Okay, number one, didn't know. Firstly, I didn't notice anything in the crowd. I didn't. Whether it was coming from other sections, I, I didn't. I didn't. I, 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 us getting on players' backs is, is a thing of the past for me. I've not seen it for almost two years now. I think, I think at least in that way, the, the fans are very good. We're, we're supportive of the players that were on the pitch, which is so important. In terms of what I think of him, um, I think. I don't, you know, it's a hard one for me. I'm not 100% sure yet. I've got no criticisms, there's no negatives, but I, I, I'm not quite sure what he's going to offer us going forward with, with what, what we're trying to do. But having said that, you know, he's been involved uh, a couple, you know, as I said, he, had, he was involved in, in, in the attacks. He, he can, he's, he is a physical presence. He could potentially be a target man because, yeah, I've always been talking about this. You know, having a target man, what a little bit what Giroud was for us, he, because he's got the strength, he's got the physical stature, stature for it. <clears throat> but I still feel he's hung over from what his experience at Chelsea was a little bit. I still think that that we will soon see the habits of his club before Chelsea. I think it was Leverkusen, wasn't it? 
I and and he was he was great there. He was great. He really was good. from an attacking the midfield position. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I still think there's a lot to come from him. I think we just got. I, you see, with with Rice and, and well, let's hope Timber is back soon. I think that they'll we, we're going to see the great stuff quicker than we do with Havertz. That's that's just a gut feeling. I could be completely wrong, but to be honest, from what I've seen of him, he hasn't done much wrong either. I'm not saying he set the world alight. But at the same time, I don't think he's done much wrong. And he has been involved in things. You know, to be honest, that um, was it the uh, the Community Shield where he had the, he had the, he had that chance where he had to turn and then create a shot. I mean, that, that wasn't a bad effort. You know, I don't think he's done much wrong. I don't think he's done, as I said, I don't think he's done anything that's like, wow, what a signing. But I just want people not to think about the price tag too much. And I just want everyone to be a bit more patient with him. Those that are criticising him, because we are going to see that. I, I believe, fully believe, it's probably my faith that we will see the Leverkusen um, habits rather than the Chelsea one. I think Chelsea just played him wrong. He just didn't fit in that club at all. And even then, he was probably arguably one of their better players, you know. And he's going to always be known for scoring their Champions League winner. Just to be patient with him, Jack. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts have been. But I was going to ask you that actually. Yeah, I, I agree entirely, and I think I wonder if if the switching him from the eight to the nine is 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 a good thing for his development at the eight, which I think is his intention. Like, if we're to see into the future, I think his intention is still what we kind of believed early on in the, in that he wants Rice and Havertz and Odegaard to be amongst the a midfield three. I think what we're seeing is is Thomas Partey is not re- ready ready at all to relinquish that position, and 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 nor should he be with the way he's playing. I just yeah. think it's, he's, that transition can happen in time, but it's, it's, we shouldn't be doing it just yet. And I think what that creates a real issue is it's almost to have some rice and possibly when everyone's fit if that ever happens of course um <laughs> going for going for the one position. That's where Havertz might need to bide his time a little bit, be a little bit patient. And I think I think that's that's absolutely fine. I think. Um, yeah, be patient with him. I think I think he's got a lot of good attributes, and I yeah. think Arteta will get the best out of him as well. I just, in the meantime, if we are using him in the eight and it's not working, I don't want Arteta to be too stubborn with it. That this is my signing. This is the guy that I push for. Right. Do you know what I mean? Where it costs us in the short term. Yes. It's okay to have a player that takes a little bit of time. That maybe needs a little bit of time on on the bench when someone you feel is a little bit more ready for the system that you've currently set up to get results now, which is so important. And uh, you, you've seen, if you, for example, Pep, he didn't play Grealish a lot in his first season. Absolutely. You know what I mean? And now he's thriving and people criticised a lot. So I think Arteta has to be strong enough, and I think he is, to, to do that. But um, I don't want him to be too stubborn with it and saying, you know, I'll fully back this guy and it needs to work from the get-go because it doesn't always work like that. And he's, he is changing a lot this season, right? Last season, we saw him implement some new things. But I think this season, again, we're seeing just from the lineup, he's changing a lot of things at once and trying to make us more adaptable, more, the, you know, have ability to harder to read as a, as a team and different setups, maybe for different games. Last season, it was really all about same 11, same 11, same 11, consistency, consistency, and get that fluidity. And I, I like that way. But in terms of the longevity of the season, that doesn't necessarily bode well, especially when injuries come up and things like that. You have to be really lucky for a squad like ours, I think. So it's really interesting. I found it really interesting game. Disappointed in the goal, obviously, because I don't, don't like to concede. And I felt, you know, I even though, you know, in terms of the XG, they had two shots on target. We had 80% of the ball. I felt the scoreline still flattered them, to be honest. And I felt oh, yeah. we should have put the third away earlier. And... um that would have been that would have been you know the game would have been very different from there on. But that hopefully we learned that lesson quicker than we did last season because yeah. last season we didn't learn it. Yeah, I think I think the only concern is the number of goals we concede at home. We've got to stop Big that. Time. Yeah, why are we conceding so many goals? I mean, yeah, away is a different thing, but really at home we should be a fortress. We've got to maintain that. Ball. Yeah, we were getting the wins last season. Of course we were. That's why we were top of the table for what two forty eight days of the of the season. But we were conceding a lot as well. We were conceding a lot of goals. That is something we've got to, we've got to stop. Yeah. And I was, we were all hoping for a clean sheet on Saturday, but it didn't come. Hopefully, the next game, the next few games, we will. So, yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, no, absolutely. And overall, really positive. The next game's going to be harder. Palace, uh, I didn't watch them, mm. but they are a good team at home. Hodgson yeah. drills them really well. They've got some good players. Eze, I know Lise's, um 
injured, but Decore, you know, they've, they've got some good players, good athletes. Eze's a real dangerous player. And it's going to be a lot, we're going to have to be a lot better, I think. We're going to, you know, collect uh, for, for the 90 minutes, we're going to have to be a lot better. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how he adjusts the setup. Before we go, um, oh, wow, well, I might, might be even on time here. This is amazing. Um, before we go, Aaron Ramsey, I think we're going to announce David uh, Raya or Raya, might be Raya, um, David Raya today. Um, what are your thoughts? I know you don't like to talk about transfers until it's on the ticker tape and Arsenal Wenger announces it from FIFA headquarters quarters all that sort of stuff but um <laughs> but um well what are your thoughts on uh there's something that came out pretty conclusively but it's a bit up in the air in that um it was supposed to be a 30 million straight fee for, for david Ryder coming as a replacement for matt turner who went to forest of course and plays that played in this game and i think it's undeniable that david Ryder is, is an upgrade without doubt on that but beyond that we're, we're now learning that it's a three million initial loan to help us with ffp but there's been some journalists that have reported that basically this turns into a permanent deal anyway. There's not really the details on that, but since that's occurred, since Ornstein announced that, there's been a lot of other pretty reliable journalists, journalists that have said, basically, it feels relatively inevitable that this will be not an option, but an inevitability that we buy this player. But I just wondered what your thoughts are on the on, on bringing in a goalkeeper of that level, the, the possible ability, you know, the loan option and what that might mean and, 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 and how you feel it might play out with him and Ramsdale. So um, th- this really reminds me of, do you remember when uh, Martinez came in for Leno and he yeah. had a tremendous, how many games, tw- a dozen games, he was almost flawless. And yeah. then there's all this talk about getting rid of him. And we were actually saying on the podcast that it's very rare to have two top end keepers at one club. It just doesn't happen. It just does not happen. And I was like, why can't it happen? Why can't they compete? It reminds me of that. I just started thinking about that situation. All right, then Martinez turned out to be a very, not a very nice human being uh, with his antics and, and whatnot. So I'm actually glad now, so glad he went. Um, and but it kind of takes me back to that where potentially we got two number one keepers and we'll have, if this goes through. Um, I'm not too worried about that. I think, I think Ramsdale's a very strong character. Uh, I think he's a. I think he's a great, great asset to our club. By the way, I always liked Ramsdale, and I think it will do him good. And the fact that now whether that was just him coming out of the statement, just for the sake of coming out of a statement, I don't know. Whether he genuinely thought I'm going to put something out, and he said bring it. He was just saying bring it. I'm yes, glad. Yeah, he did. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm happy for for the competition. It will bring the best out, and it will push each other. It will bring the best out in both of us. I think it'll be really interesting to see how Arteta deals with it and how much of each keeper they get on the pitch. It'll, it'll be really interesting to see. There's no doubt the other guy's a great player. I, 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 I'm very blinkered. I think I've said this before. When it comes to football, I just look at Arsenal. I don't really look at other players too much unless, unless you know, it, it gets to the point where we 100% know that they're going to become an Arsenal player. Then I might look at, read about them, look on YouTube, do the usual stuff. Um, but obviously I know he's a quality keeper. He could even become... You know, Eclipse even Ramsdale, possibly, don't know yet, don't know what, what's, what the plans are. So I, I'm i okay with it. I'm surprised, massively surprised. Oh, I think we're lot we thought, were initially, yeah. Uh, yeah, initially I was thinking we were going to be, hopefully, you know, answering your question about are we going to get someone in that was going to aid Saka um, at one point. And that was a position that, or something that needed to be considered because you can't make Saka work like we did, or he has been over the last few seasons. Yeah. Um, so when when all of a sudden there was this all this talk about a keeper, I'm thinking, huh? What, what's going on here? It was it was a huge shock. I think it will be okay. Um, it'll be interesting for sure. Um, and I think he's a great keeper from what I've heard and what what you guys have been saying about him. Potentially, as I said, he could even eclipse Ramsdale. Um, and it'll be good competition. And it's wonderful that Arteta and Edu have got this vision that we're going to make sure we've got a, we've got competition in every position on the pitch. No pit, no 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 position is going to get you know overlooked. We're going to make sure that we've got competition because the players then will drive each other to be better. That's what you mentioned a little bit earlier about Trossard. You yeah. know, every player is going to be driven to do better. I'm getting noticed. The way Eddie said to Arteta, you've got to play me because look at what I'm doing. All the players should be doing that. All of the players should be doing that. Maybe they are, we don't know. But yeah. they should be. The fact that Arteta actually singled Eddie out. So maybe the same with the goalkeeping position. 
And if that makes us better, Jack, if that makes us a better club, I'm all for it, 100%. And with, with this money thing, I think it's genius. You know, we don't... Oh, yeah, the, the initial loan <laughs> thing's fantastic. Genius. Yeah. Brilliant. And I think that's where they've improved. You know, we were struggling before with transfers, both in and out. You know, there were some players that we got rid of for stupidly cheap money. We, we, why? He's worth more than that. What the hell are you doing? Or let them let the contract run out and we get nothing for them, like, you know, Ramsey... I thought Van Persie was dirt cheap to United and then he won the title that season. Uh, you know, it's just things like that where we, now we're very, very queued up, I think, both ways, I think, anyway. So it's, yeah. still mistakes will be made. Of course they will. That's life. Yeah. But generally, I think we're very cute with what we're doing now. So, I, I, again, kudos to Edu and Arteta for doing that. Yeah. Um, but, I, I bring, I, yeah, like Ramsdale said, bring it. Bring it, Jack. I don't yeah, know what you absolutely. thought about. Right. Well, I feel, um, yeah, I love it. I love it. Actually, I think it's, one of the most surprising and exciting moves that we made this summer. I, I, well, as soon as I heard about it, I, I thought this is this is brilliant. But if I'm putting my Mystic Meg hat on ish and predicting into the future, I agree with you. I don't think this there's longevity in having two goalkeepers that are this good. And I think this is a one season where we did it. We did it with Leno and Martinez under our tether for one season. We 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 did it with Leno and Ramsdale for one season under Mick Arteta. And I think this is a one season thing, which we can really take advantage of if something happens to one of them. But in the end, I think one of them's coming out as, uh, as top dog and one of them's leaving. And if I'm to put my true hat on, I would predict that David Raya would be our first team goalkeeper by mid September, October, maybe. And I'd predict that Ramsdale leaves by next summer. So that would be my prediction. And the reason for that, I'm not just sort of saying it, uh, the reason for that is I don't think the loan makes a difference. I, don't, I think well, I think we're going to sign this guy permanently no matter what. I don't. I, don't th- I think it makes a difference maybe for the financial reasons. Hopefully that allows us to maybe do something else this window. I don't know if we're being really sort of greedy. But um, the, the other reason is this goalkeeping coach is literally his mentor. He goes back to when he played at Blackburn. This goalkeeping coach brought him in. He's literally like, you know, he's, it's like Cesc Fabregas going to Arsenal Wenger. It's, he's literally his like father figure mentor he's bringing him in we wanted him before Ramsdale all the links were there before Ramsdale I think we offered 10 million back five years four years ago when Arteta first came in and they wanted like 25 or something so we moved away from it and then we went up oh they didn't they want to sell him that's what it was and we ended up paying for Ramsdale um I think this is the ideal person they want a lot of the data points to him being a better goalkeeper than Ramsdale at this moment in time one issue with Ramsdale is he's not hitting his peak yet so you don't really know if he's going to get a lot better hopefully we would um, so that's a slight risk but um, and I, I, I think I think Mikata believes he's going to improve us a lot and I think he's going to he's, he's going to start sooner rather than later I don't think he'll be on the bench for long I really don't I think he's going to he's going to be our first team goalkeeper I really do I just don't see I think it was an opportunity in the market I think we probably thought he would already be sold by now and he wasn't and we saw that maybe there was interest in Matt Turner and we decided to to make a move that we've probably always wanted to make for about four years. And I think I like Ramsdale. I do like Ramsdale a lot. I'm a big fan of Ramsdale. And, but I do think there are some slight issues with him. I, I don't think he's, this guy is proven by stats to be a lot better from crosses. He catches a lot more than Ramsdale from crosses, even though he's shorter. So he commands his box a lot more. That's what it tells me. His save percentage is a lot higher. Um, his long pass accuracy is a lot higher. Short passes, not so much, but, but Brentford don't do a lot of that. So it's kind of interesting. But the, the big data points to him being a better goalkeeper now than they're an Aaron Ramsdale. And I think they've noticed it personally. And maybe wow. they, they notice more. So that's my prediction. I'm going to look really stupid around October when uh, David Ryan is <laughs> like, just sitting on the bench watching Arsenal. But uh, that, yeah, that's a prediction. I didn't know the history. I didn't realise Yeah, it's up, really interesting. Just to see, I don't get involved with the transfer gossip and stuff. Yeah. So, and, but, I did no, not no, no. know if you that we were up. So that's interesting. Yeah, it's that's really interesting. Really I'm trying to see um see some more data on him, but the data is really, really interesting on 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 them both. Like crosses, I don't know exactly what the percentage means, but um, uh, he's crossing. Um, Aaron Ramsdale's crosses stopped is in the fiftieth percentile, whereas um David Raya's crosses stopped are in the ninety third percentile when compared to all goalkeepers. Um, his save percentage is in the ninety second percentile, whereas. Aaron Ramsdale is in the 37th percentile. Aaron Ramsdale is actually 12th in the league for save percentage. What that basically says is, if I'm to interpret it, is we don't save a lot of the shots that are being, being hit on us, meaning a lot of teams get a lot from the little um, opportunities they have on our goal. I think that I think they had a little bit of concern with Ramsdale. I, I, there was a little hiccup towards the end of the season. I think overall Aaron Ramsdale has been a 
very, very good goalkeeper for us, and I really like him. I love his attitude. I think he, he mm. just seems like such a top bloke. But I think he's got. I think we're bringing this guy to be the be our number one goalkeeper. Uh, and I, yeah. I think he can say everything, but actions will speak louder than words. And I think he will be able to number one goalkeeper in about six weeks. I, that's what I think. And that's, I don't think just well, unless something happens, you know, injury wise stuff like that. But how old is he? You know? Twenty seven. Twenty seven. Oh, he's older, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah, and there's a. Fa- I don't know if you saw it. There's a fantastic interview of him talking about not being the number one goalkeeper and what his attitude was to them being the number one goalkeeper. And he, he had a fantastic attitude, attitude about goalkeepers union. This was David Raya, uh, um, and saying, you know, I really want to make sure that I treat every goalkeeper respect and work really well with them. So I think they both have a really good attitude. But in the end, when one goalkeeper sitting on the bench every week, because I don't, I personally, there's been some talk about us rotating goalkeepers. Like this one's going to take Champions League and this one's going to say, I don't think it's going to happen. Mm. I don't think it's going to happen. There, there, there's no do one that, that does that. No, you don't. Need, you don't need to. Do that. There's no one that does that. No, he's not going to go. Oh, uh, this game's a bit more for David Rowe because we're going to go a little bit longer. I, I don't think they do that with goalkeepers. I think goalkeepers is no. about consistency. I think no, it is, no. and I don't think he's going to tweak that much. Jack, the only time you see a goalkeeper change is if you play in the League Cup, the Caribbean Cup, or something like that, and maybe the FA Cup sometimes. Yeah. That's, yeah, That's exactly. It. It'll be really your, interesting your to see how it plays Champions- out. Yeah, exactly. Be really your Premier League goalkeeper is normally the same. Yeah, normally. Yeah, there's a fan. I'll send you the video. There's a fantastic video. I think it was Tifo Football did on why do Arsenal want Raya when they've got Ramsdale? It was called something like that, and it was oh. re- they broke it down really well. They were like, he's just a little bit better at everything. That's basically the conclusion. But they had all the data with it, and I was like, oh. yeah. And I, I watched over Raya a lot way back when we were linked to him because I was like, oh what are we doing here? Because I didn't like Leno. And I was like, oh God, because I was really yeah, excited yeah, about getting another goalkeeper. Biscuit Hans Leno. Biscuit Hans, I was about to yeah, say. I was, I was, but, um, and no one really believed we needed to change Leno at that time. This one's amazing because I, I didn't believe we thought we needed to change Ramsdale. That's the thing with this one. And I, I, to be honest, I didn't really sit here and think, oh, well, we need to change Ramsdale. But I did think if he doesn't go to where we want in a year or two, maybe that's something we might look at. So it was really... If it is true, if I'm, if I'm right, which I could be wrong, it's really ruthless. I mean, that is that is. Oh, that is that's um, um, yeah. That no one is safe in this team. Even someone yeah. as strong a character as Ramsdale, no one is safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's wow. just the sack of Odegaard and Salibas that we're left. Uh, you've got you've got to admire Arteta for it. He's he's saying oh, it's it. brilliant. It's brilliant. I mean, what he did with the Birmingham, it's fantastic. It's yeah. just like no, don't care. You're not for me. Don't I care. think I love him. I think I, I, I love what he does with the transfer market. I, I think he's just the most incredible way he thinks. And I think Edu's as well. I think they're just together. It's such a team. I think it's amazing. But last thing, prediction. It's a Monday mm. night game. So we've got to wait a little bit. It's a Monday night game, but what's your predictions? Any big changes you think you'll see? And what's the, the scoreline prediction? First away game in the season. I think the main thing is, I think Gabriel will come back in. I think. Yeah. I think. And Zinchenko, uh, you think? Maybe yeah, maybe yes, yes. They're going to be out, but... Yeah, I think I've got a feeling, as much as I want him to play more, I still yeah. think he'll, he, won't, he won't start Trossard. I'll be yeah. shocked as he does. He's got to the point now where I'll be surprised if, he's, if I see him starting. So I think everywhere else, it might be very, very similar. But you're right. I think Zinchenko and I think Gabriel will come in. I think that's my th- thoughts. Tim is not going to be available, even if he, they turn around and say he's fine. I, I, if they risk him, I, don't, don't. Just no don't. way, Zinchenko's yeah. Zinchenko's ready. Zinchenko's ready. Let's give Sinchenko a start to the season um, and uh, see how he gets on. But I think, I think for me, there will be those with the changes. I don't know what you think, but that's changes. And then, um, look, we know Palace is going to be oppressive. They've got an incredible fan base. It's going to be a very noisy money. They will thrive on that. They will thrive on it. Um, so it's a hard game. It's a really difficult game. But I'm hoping we've got enough, enough, We've got the little bit of momentum from winning the Community Shield and then winning, thankfully, getting past Forest, Forest on Saturday. Uh, we've got the wind in ourselves a little bit from that. Hopefully the boys aren't buoyant. Um, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll just win. I think it'll be a tight game. I think we'll, we'll win it 2-1. That's my prediction. Nice. I just want to also say, very quickly, sorry, I'm moving but I, I, I just want to say one thing. The change we saw in the second half in the terms of the play, I wonder, this is just me being speculative again, I wonder if the players were affected with what happened with Timber mm. because they all look really upset by it. Yeah. So I wonder if that had a little bit of a hangover and then that changed. Because yeah. the, the level definitely dropped in the second half from us. Yeah, it really did. Yeah, so I just wonder if that has a bit. Anyway, but let's see, let's, let's see all the players coming fresh again on Monday, new attitude, 
new focus and we get the get a win. I, I just want the win. Forget yeah, of the course. Season, I don't care. The first these first few games, let's just get the three points. Just let's just mirror whatever City doing, and then we're hoping because they're playing Newcastle, one of those two. Well, either both will drop points or one will drop points. So this is a fantastic opportunity for us to just leapfrog at least one of them. Yeah, this week. Yeah, so they had an impressive start as well. Newcastle did very. Yeah, impressive. yeah, yeah, yeah. They did. But very, they did. yeah. Mind you, and I am away from home against big teams. <laughs> we know what he does, don't we? We know what he does. It's, it's not a surprise. Did, did he bring a centre back on when they were losing? Was that right? I don't. I wasn't watching the game, but nothing surprises me. Second season, and I am We've all been there. <laughs> Uh, so, so you know, it was hilarious. A lot of people giving them tips for the top four. I was like, I don't know if you. I just love was looking at Martinez's face. Every goal going, he's like, oh, that I would it's like. Not my to fault. See. It's not. It's not my fault. Yeah. You, your rubbish. Yeah, I loved it. I loved yeah, it. Yeah, I love that. I don't like him at all anymore. I really no. don't like him. But who's your best score? Oh, uh, uh, gosh! Oh God, Saka. I'm going to stick with Saka. Saka. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Mm. I'll go. Uh, I'll go one nil Arsenal. I one nil Arsenal, and I'll go Martinelli first goal scorer. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like you said, any any win we got. Well, I think it's gonna be a very tough game. So let's see. Let's see if anything movement in the transfer window. I've just seen very reliable source come out that Kieran Tinney's being linked to a loan to Newcastle. Oh, um, whoa! Gosh, we yeah. were saying, that, yeah, we, we were, we were, we were. Um, but oh. they, they said they don't know if it's with an option or obligation. I'm going to say it now. Absolutely pointless loaning him without an obligation because mm. we're never going to call him back. And I personally think if you loan someone with no obligation, you've got an intention at least of bringing them back or increasing their value. I don't think Eve is going to happen with Kieran Tierney. I think you've got to get what money you can for him now, get the wages. Absolutely. So let's see. I'd hold out on that and look, I think other Premier League clubs will come in for him. Someone will want a left back for sure. There's still two weeks left in the window. Why don't you wait out? Let's see. Neil, I've kept you too long. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. This no. will be up on all your streams on YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube and give us a like. That would help us. And um, But you can see it on at Purely Arsenal FP on Twitter and we post all the links there. But we do like it if you tune in on YouTube and give us a little subscription on there. We really appreciate it. It helps us a lot. Neil, thank you so much. Up the Arsenal. One we're down. 37 to go. Let's go Arsenal. Up the boys. <laughs> <laughs>